Today we're going to talk about discovery calls and why interior designers don't need them. So what are discovery calls and uh, where did they come from? Well, discovery calls originated from sales and coaching because uh, in order to make a, a kind of high ticket sale to or in those industries, and I'm a qualified coach, so I have been using these systems in my business for a long time. Um, the origin of these were to help you to connect with your client, but also understand deeper seated issues that, um, I mean, for example, psychological issues that you would get to um, uh, kind of briefly get to during usually an hour long session. And that would help you connect with the client, understand what it is that they're really going through, kind of, um, you know, De delve deep into their pain points, understand uh, what those uh, issues might potentially be and whether you can help them. So you would do that by asking open-ended questions, uh, doing active listening. So these are kind of coaching terminology that um, you uh, or, and skills that you use during this session in order to connect with your client and understand what it is that uh, they need and whether you can actually help them because these are, you know, these are personal issues that uh, you, you know, you don't just open up to anyone about and you need to know whether you have the skills as a coach, life coach, maybe health coach, relationship coach, uh, business coach, whether you can actually help them. Business coaching is slightly different because um, depending on where you're at, you don't have to go that deep, but it could be an emotional issue that is holding you back from your business, which often it can be. So um, that's why we use it in the coaching world. But interior design, um, well, let's let's start with why I think you don't need it as an interior designer. Um, and firstly, it's because you don't need to overcomplicate the onboarding process as an interior designer, because getting clients as an interior designer isn't that difficult. And you don't have to put barriers in the way of um, speaking to clients. And the majority of clients that I see, or that I've worked with and I've seen my, my mentees work with, they, well, they are terrified to call an interior designer because they're intimidated by us. And we've got to get through this because most people are really quite worried and nervous to call an interior designer. So if you're adding these extra barriers in the way of like book a call with me, you know, what are they like? I've seen them everywhere. Discovery calls are a nice kind of you can hide behind uh, free chat, 10 minute, no obligation um, discussion, uh, free consultation, automated appointments. I'll get into those and kind of introductory calls. As somebody who's providing a service and potentially a product, you are obliged to tell people what it is that you're offering. So you don't need to tell them that they can call you. <laughs> that should be a given. But so many interior designers are putting up these barriers and because they're, well, they're insecure usually and they don't feel that they're coming across as professional. So they're putting all these barriers in the way of speaking to their clients. and. If you're providing a service, if you're selling something, I mean, imagine if you were going to somebody and they put up all these barriers, which often um, now these days people do, to speaking to somebody when you just want to buy their product. It's infuriating. <laughs> so if you think about um, just trying to buy something and uh, this person, well, even just like the services of a solicitor or a lawyer, accountant, just another service provider, even a plumber, let's say. And we just try and pick up the phone and just say, I just want to know a little bit about your services. And either you say, well, thanks for calling, but I'll have to book you in to speak to me in um, next week sometime when they're no longer hot and ready to speak to you. So, um, <laughs> or they don't answer at all, or they don't even put a phone number on their con or their contact details, which, um, I think going on to barriers, the fear of putting on your details um, doesn't need to be there unless you have a, a, a very uh, specific reason 
to that you've been you know you have like a, a tpo a tree preservation order <laughs> a um uh, a re like a restraining order against somebody so um and that is really rare people especially interior designers who are like me working for themselves from their own home are afraid to put their details out there but you shouldn't be that in the 20 years that i've been a designer i've had one free co call me that is it you do not have to worry um, that you're going to be harassed or um, that people are going to, they, the term is like tie kickers, they're going to call and waste your time. Well, it's your obligation to speak to people as a business owner, firstly. Um, you, it is required um, to give the knowledge of what you're offering to people who are trying to buy your service. So, you know, that's your requirement and responsibility. Um, but you don't need to be afraid of you know the odd person and honestly in 20 years I've had one frico and probably maybe a handful and I've had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of clients handful of people who have wasted my time on the phone and that it's it's really it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things not every person that's going to be calling you you don't need to kind of uh, like pre-qualify though all of those people because if you're marketing correctly, you will be attracting the right people to you who just need to like uh, clarify a few things. That's it. You don't need to convert them on a one hour call. So as you can see, the, the barriers that we're putting up by offering, you know, these things and writing these things on our website or even on social media are actually scaring our clients away. They're saying, well, I mean, subconsciously, they're thinking, oh, it's, um, it's a 10 minute free call. Okay. Well, what does that really mean? Is she going to be watching the time? Uh, what if I take 15 minutes? What if, um, I want her to come over and see my property to price it? Um, what, you know, there's all of these things that are going through your cl potential client's head and you're sitting there putting barriers up. So instead of, um, making all of these things more difficult for your client to get in touch with you or to ask you questions or to clarify certain things about hiring you, make it easy. Don't complicate it. Make it easy for people to ask you questions, to, to get in touch with you and just to clarify. Obviously that comes with a full marketing strategy because you need to put out their services that you know that your clients actually want and are willing to buy. You need to know what kind of um, problems you're solving for your clients. And this doesn't happen in a discovery call. This happens in market research, which happens, which is the precursor to all of these things um, before you even start putting your marketing yourself and putting yourself out there into the world. So your website should be clear. Your social media should be clear what it is that you're offering. And so when you answer the phone, you don't need to be afraid because most of the time people are just sitting there asking to clarify a few things because they're pretty much ready to buy from you. And um, I know because I've now coached hundreds and hundreds of interior designers who are terrified of answering the phone and they don't know what to say. Well, you will know what to say when you've got a marketing plan, when you are confident about the services that you're selling, when you know how to market yourself. And the majority of people who are going to be calling you literally just want that little icing on the cake where they just want to clarify certain things. And you imagine you've just done all of this work to market yourself correctly. And then you put this barrier up where there, it just seems so difficult to get in touch with you or to book a time with you. They want to know that you're going to prioritize their project. I won projects over huge firms, just little solo old me, because I was prioritizing my clients. They looked at the bigger firms, very famous firms, and came to me instead because they said to me, and this is multiple clients, said that they knew that I would prioritize and give the right time and attention to their project, which is what they wanted. They paid me a lot of money for that. And they didn't pay the very, very expensive interior designers for that, or not, not that I'm not any expensive anymore, but the really famous ones. So um, I think you don't need to be afraid. You need to understand that the client is actually more intimidated to speak to you than you are to, you know, clarify the certain things that you should know off by heart anyway. So instead of highlighting your insecurities and putting all these barriers up 
in um in order to uh like not speak to the client because that's what it looks like even though you just think that it looks more professional by putting all these workflows in place um coming from uh an experienced mentor and interior designer i can tell you that this just extends the pain of the onboarding process because you don't need to do that getting clients is easy it doesn't require all of this nonsense that um i mean it's been given to you by coaches from other industries and you know as an interior designer you need an interior designer who is a coach because you don't want and I, it breaks my heart because I hear it all the time people saying to me oh I had this coach and you know they were really really good but they couldn't help me with all of this stuff and I'm like no that's right because they're they're trained in one thing and I know because I've been trained in coaching so I know what they've been trained in and um it's it's a very different to the process of interior design and I struggled that when I started my business because obviously there were no interior design coaches when I started so I had to create these systems from um from all of the knowledge that I had including these other industries so um let's have a look at the large versus small project because I think this is really where most people get confused and uh, if you've watched any of my videos, if you understand, or if you've even watched any of my uh, read our blogs or read uh, uh, vlogs, uh, listen to vlogs, watch our vlogs and social media, you'll know that I always teach small project versus large project. The traditional structure is probably what you understand, is what you've been taught at design school. This is how you run a project from start to finish, follows the ROBA plan of work or wherever you're, you are, you'll follow the architect's plan of work. So concept, plan, planning, um, technical design, detail design, and you'll follow that process because if you're working on a traditional project, it's probably a large enough project to have an architect, an interior designer, landscape architect, project manager, civil or structural engineer, civil engineers, and like quite large projects. So if you're working in that way, the types of clients that you're going to be, uh, who you'll be dealing with, if you're even working directly with the client, not their um, PA, these are people who have very specific needs and very specific, um, uh, well, personalities. So they are going to want you to not only show them respect, uh, when they call you, they're going to want to know that you're going to answer their call because they're important people and they have a lot of money and they're spending it with you. So for you to, um, you know, like insult them by giving them an automated, um, uh, like sign up link, it's, you're never going to get that client. <laughs> if you see my point, these people need very, very high touch, very personal service. You're going to see how they fold their underwear, <laughs> right? Eventually, whether that's, um, you know, when you're finishing their, their project or when you're, when you're actually designing um, the walk-in wardrobe. So you will get to know this client very personally and they're not going to trust somebody with that kind of information and that kind of personal service with somebody who doesn't even bother to pick up the phone and speak to them. Do you see my point? So that's one type of client, so large projects. Um, there is one caveat there because the tech industry, some people who are working for themselves, I would classify this kind of person as me. Working for myself, I work into the night. I uh, love automation because I enjoy just knowing that I can fit things into my diary without anyone else. I don't have a PA, I just do. I like to automate things and make things work efficiently for me. So yes, that would work for me, but I'm a very specific client type. Does that make sense? Um, and looking for very specific things. So then there are the small project, which is the vast majority of projects that you're going to be working on as an interior designer, unless you're in the luxury industry. So, or doing uh, full service traditional. So 
these smaller projects are the types of projects that you're going to be doing. And I'm talking up to up to a million, right? So usually I'd say up to 100K because that's where actually the vast majority of projects are, up to 100K. Um, and that's dollars or pounds or Aussie dollars, Canadian dollars, American dollars. Um, so when you're looking at that kind of, you know, 100K is a really good kind of um, understanding that this is a small project. If your client says to you, um, I'm going to be spending $80,000 on the refurbishment of my home, then you know it's a small project. It might not be a small project to you or it might not be a small project to the client, but you need to understand that this is not the kind of client that we were talking about before, where they would spend 80K on a sofa, right? <laughs> so you need to know the difference and the, the requirements of these clients. So when you start looking at these smaller projects, you need to make a profit on these. And a fee from 80K even, you've these clients, aren't going to give you £50,000 or dollars for an 80k project unless you're doing install and um, supply as well. So this is where we start, well, and then you'd be in full service anyway, but th the majority of small projects are your, you providing a service of design predominantly, maybe some technical design and perhaps a little bit of installation, some sourcing. So there, there's only so much that your client will want from you because they've only got so much in their budget to pay you. And because of that, you shouldn't be extending your onboarding process to, um, to nurture and nurture a, a client who just can't afford that kind of service from you. So the way we treat smaller projects and larger projects is completely different because these people, our clients, need different things. They're looking for different things. And in order for you to supply the service profitably, you need to provide different things. So you need to know where you're sitting in the market and you need to know how, if you are offering a discovery call, where this sits because a smaller client or a small project is, is do you really think that's a viable onboarding process for a smaller client where perhaps let's just say uh, because I know um, from experience that average cost for a, a service for an interior design service for smaller jobs is between two and a half and 10k that's not a lot of money so when you think about how much time goes into that these clients don't require full onboarding because your services really do sell themselves or they, they require full onboarding, but they, their workflow can be quite condensed and as automated as possible, right? So automation might work here depending on where it fits in the market. But uh, extending, uh, like when you think about a discovery call and how many hours go into that and the preparation, firstly, research on the client, research on the property, Re, uh, obviously you've probably already had a welcome questionnaire so by the time you've finished your discovery call and um, have made your pitch you've spent half a day on one person that might be giving you two thousand dollars or pounds which really isn't worth it right so if you start looking at then um uh the higher the like the higher budget projects these people don't want a discovery call. They want you to come over to the house and meet them because that's what you deserve to be doing, right? So two completely different systems and two completely different mindsets. So you need to know where you sit in the market. So I'm not going to harp on. I think um, I think that is, hopefully that's clear enough um, to understand why you don't need a discovery call as an interior designer. And why just keeping it simple be open be open to speaking to your clients is all you need to do i'm jay kovac i'm an interior designer and um i'm the founder of the interior designers business school here in london and i create successful interior designers who want to work for themselves on their own terms